go along. As we go along, um, but we'll talk about things like the urban fringe index, urbanization, and parcelization as being sort of the backdrop here, or one of the backdrops uh, for a discussion on aesthetics. We'll talk about aesthetic effects. Um, you know, sort of what's what a, what kind of condition of the logged woods and logging in progress is seems to be. Um, on people's minds when they are looking at or hearing logging operations. And so we're going to talk about aesthetic effects in two different contexts, but they're related. Uh, essentially, the condition of the logged woods, but also logging in progress, the sights and sounds of logging, particularly, I think, relevant to those folks who are or managing lands in more of an urban setting. I know we have several folks who have logged in and, and mentioned that they do, they do uh, manage lands or work in, in urban and suburban and uh, exurban settings. And so we'll talk about that too. Uh, maybe aesthetics related to other forest values because oftentimes there are trade-offs between aesthetics and, and other things that we do. And we, maybe we need to talk about that a little bit too without trying to bite off too much. And then some responses in, in the areas of management and operational considerations and then civil cultural and harvesting practices. What can we do differently? Um, and again, this is where Another area where I'd like to type, tap into some of your good ideas out there too. Then we'll summarize it and then and see if we what kind of time we have at the end to, to tap into some ideas. As we go along though, and you have some comments that you'd like to post, please go ahead and do that. But again, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to keep up with the comments, uh, but they sometimes they do come relatively quickly and, and I'm not able to, to really read all of them before they pass right by and the next comment's posted. And uh, I'll do my best to, to integrate what, what I hear and see um, in your comments into what we're talking about. So some background here, some things you're familiar with if, if you're from the Northeast or maybe the Eastern Seaboard or sort of the, the Middle Atlantic and maybe elsewhere in this country and in other countries. Um, uh, in the Northeast in particular, we're, we're, we have a proximity to large urban centers, uh, not just New York City and, um, and Boston, for example, but where we are, we're prox proximity to Montreal, for example, Buffalo, uh, where you're from, it might be uh, Philadelphia, uh, might be uh, Pittsburgh, or some other large metro areas. That, that really has some impact, in my opinion, on, on how we conduct harvesting operations. So that's, that's important. Uh, population uh, issues here are characteristics relevant to, to us, where we are here in the Northeast, but perhaps to you as well. Uh, growing urban fringe populations, people moving away from expanding urban areas into areas where there are forests more more often and those forests are often are often continue to be managed um, and that management sometimes could impinge on on some of the sensitivities or sensibilities of some of the folks who are moving closer and closer and living around and in the forest exurbanization which is simply the the migration of urban residents into more rural environments uh, so it's more like a, a, you know, if we think of it in terms of fire terms, you know, a, you know, urban fringe expansion is sort of the, the sort of the leading edge of a of a fire from an urban area into rural areas. Exurbanization is more like a spot fire, you know, where where folks are are jumping, you know, over the urban fringe and into truly rural areas, oftentimes bringing with them different ideas, notions, knowledge, uh, attitudes about about forestry and forest management, and sometimes timber harvesting particularly, and oftentimes what's driving their reaction to, to forest management practices um, is what they see and hear. Uh, they may know little or nothing about, uh, about silviculture or forest ecology. Some do, but a lot don't. Uh, but they know what they can see and hear and react accordingly. And then parcelization, some good work on parcelization coming out of UMass, Dave Kittrich's work um, on parcelization in Massachusetts, which is pointing to smaller and smaller parcel sizes, which really also dictate to some degree or drive to some degree what we do relative to harvesting and aesthetics. So a lot of things going on here, um, a lot, you know, proximity to urban centers, um, people who perhaps um, not from a rural area now moving to rural areas and bringing with them their own values and, and attitudes, which are important for us to understand and, and, and try to uh, accommodate in some ways whenever we can. Forest uses are diverse. We have a diverse landowning public in this region of the country, especially east of the Mississippi. Um, most of the land is owned by non-industrial private forest landowners or family forest owners. 
uh, with uh, diverse, often competing management objectives. And so, uh, and among those are, are aesthetics or preservation of aesthetics or improving the aesthetics of the wood lot. But there are other objectives too. So we're not typically talking about landowners with a single objective. And that, that makes things both richer from a management standpoint, but also more complex in a lot of ways. Um, forest practices uh, shifting around in Maine, for example, in 2008, almost 5,000 acres were so-called terminally harvested. That's a term that came out of New Hampshire and has been adopted by others. These are acres that will not be, that have been harvested, but, but have been harvested in such a way that they won't be, the land won't be retained in forest anymore, just so therefore the, the, the term terminal harvesting. In Maine, uh, it's not quite the same as liquidation harvesting in Maine, but there's some similarities between what, what Mainers use, the term liquidation harvesting and terminal harvesting. Again, not exactly the same, but we have these phenomena, these forestry practices that were that um, are disturbing to some, but the reality, you know, whether they disturb us or not, uh, is a reality that uh, we're, we're losing forest land and a lot of harvesting taking place sort of on the urban fringe, sometimes converting to other land uses that preclude future forestry. Mentioned forest ownership, a lot of non-industrial private forest owners here, oftentimes uh, working directly with loggers. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, uh, but usually there's no logging contract research has shown, research we've done in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and a little bit in Maine and others have done elsewhere uh, and usually no forests are involved. So that's, you know, that's the reality in about 80, 75 to 80 percent of the harvest on non-industrial private forests um, in, in many states. It's not true of all states, but uh, I can say that certainly of several northeast states. Silviculture is typically partial harvesting. For example, in the state of Maine in 2008, less than 3% of the harvested acres were in clear cuts, um, and that's probably less than some of the neighboring states. And so um, we're not seeing as much even age management, certainly not seeing as much clear cutting as we had in the past, and partial harvesting seems to dominate now. Uh, harvesting is usually ground-based in this part of the country. It's often tractive, that is, the wood is usually dragged. Um, so we're talking about wood that's dragged behind a skidder, tractor, bulldozer, sometimes an animal. Uh, it's ground-based. It's not always tractive. It could be non-tractive. So, for example, a forwarder may be used to transport wood um, to, a, to a landing, from the woods to a landing. So mostly ground-based, often tractive, um, and that sort of typifies a lot of what's going on here in the Northeast United States. And then the loggers are generally independent loggers or independent logging contractors. And there's a difference. I don't think we have to go into the subtleties and the difference. They certainly make a big difference in, in northern Maine, for example, where we're typically talking about loggers who contract directly with large companies versus a lot of the rest of, of New England, for example, where we have independent loggers who are oftentimes the stumpage buyers. That's not often generally true of the logging contractors who are essentially offering a service. So there are other characteristics we can, we, can, we can get into here and discuss, but I thought those were some of the relevant ones here as we try to move forward and discuss uh, logging aesthetics. So let's move forward in that direction. Let's talk about um, some of the things that, um, that uh, sort of typify um, what, we've, what we've developed relative to knowledge about uh, logging aesthetics. And I think we have a pretty good idea of what uh, people prefer in the logged woods um, um, and again, this we're talking about something that's, that's an art and subjective, and so I'm not I'm not suggesting that all people feel that um, these are are the priorities for them. But what's come out of the literature, for example, and come out of some other studies, whether they appear in the scientific literature or not, are things that that I think most of us, as either foresters or loggers or landowners, have an understanding of. Partial harvesting, for example, versus clear cutting. In a lot of in several studies, has been shown to be a preference among among the general public and sometimes the landowning public. Retaining trees in groups, reducing slash, reducing the height of slash, uh, keeping stumps low. Out of a, a 1996 study, keep roads to a minimum. Um, oftentimes, uh, while NIPF owners want access to their lands and rely oftentimes on the harvesting job to provide that access. Uh, they do want to oftentimes want to keep the amount of road area um, to a minimum relative to the size of the tract and just enough for them to go in and recreate and, and, and uh, perhaps um, uh, derive their own firewood, for example, periodically from their own woodlot. Retain large trees. So large trees have been shown in several studies to be important to people from the standpoint of aesthetics. 
visual penetration in several studies. This is the idea, if you look at the upper left um, here, uh, that um, that is a, a uh, photographic image from about 15 years ago when I was in Pennsylvania of a, of a forest in Pennsylvania that had pretty good visual penetration. So, so in general, studies have shown that people like to see through forests. Um, of course, you know when, we, when we're looking at multi-staged or multi-aged forests, that's not as easy to do. Uh, and so there's maybe there's some trade-offs between the silviculture and and the aesthetic values associated with with uh, a particular, and then re reducing residual stand damage that that looks bad. Um, there are studies that that have pointed to reduction in residual stand damage as being a preference among a lot of people. So um, I have Carl as saying another concern is selective harvesting and riparian corridors to minimize stream back erosion. Um, and we did talk about erosion the last time, uh, I guess it was in August, Peter, when we had our, our discussion there. We may be able to get into some discussions about the, the relationship between uh, selective harvesting, repairing areas, and erosion, but maybe if we don't get into any detail there, maybe we'll have to, we'll have to save some of that for a, a later presentation or later webinar. Um, other common practices besides what we can derive from the liter literature and that are familiar to, to all you folks out there who manage your own forest land, uh, avoid tracking mud onto highways. It's unsightly. It's unsafe. Uh, if you're from West Virginia, check out the West Virginia BMPs, for example, which go into some detail about how to do that. Um, in West Virginia, for example, there are guidelines around uh, putting down coarse gravel. Uh, if you're from West Virginia, you can correct me on this. It's usually within 100 or 200 feet of entering the main road, in order to drive some of that mud that might collect on a, on the tires of a of a of a haul truck off the truck's tires before you get onto the highway. So West Virginia BMPs, for example, maybe other states BMPs or guidelines get into this. Uh, leave well-spaced standing trees within some distance of roadways and and especially public highways. Those people in New Hampshire are familiar with the forest laws in New Hampshire, which specify what this should look like. Uh, and in other words, in, in terms of leaving a, a certain amount of basal area, I believe it used to be when I was in, in New Hampshire working there, uh, half the basal area and well-distributed, well healthy trees within 150 feet of, uh, of highways. This is really about aesthetics more than it is about anything else. Uh, Road and landing locations, uh, you know, there's, there are arguments for and against hiding a landing so that it's not easily visible from a public road. Uh, I've heard foresters say, well, we should be showing the good work we're doing. Um, to me, the reality is that depending on where you are, that um, no matter what you do or what you say, there are going to be some people who object to harvesting. And uh, as I tell my students, if you can if you can operate a harvesting job and no one knows it, that you're there and you can get in and get out and fulfill the objectives of the landowner um, in such a way that people don't even know you're there, sometimes that's not a bad thing. Um, certainly, we want to show our good work to people. Um, but uh, again, depending on your location and uh, some of the anxiety that may be produced around log logging, irrespective of the quality of the job, um, you really need to consider how we how we locate ro roads and landings. I think that would be important. Um, and then cleaning landings. A lot of state BMPs, uh, even though BMPs typically are focused on water quality, um, a lot of states include um, elements of their BMPs that relate to making sure the landing is clean of debris. And that has a lot less to do with water quality than it does with with really the uh, the appearance of those landings. And, and there are a lot of other good ideas out there. These are just some of them. And again, you folks will have others that hopefully we can, we can discuss as well. So those are some ideas, common practices, things from the literature that have, you know, people have studied this and, and have surveyed in one way or another the general public or the landowning public or certain aspects or dimensions of the public. Um, I think what I'd like to do is briefly here is just transition into sort of the, okay, what about the sights and sounds of logging? And this became an issue for us when I was at the University of Maine as we were realizing more and more that people more and more were not just looking at the aftermath of logging and reacting positively or negatively or somewhere in between, but were also becoming coming in closer and closer contact to logging as was being conducted. And we wanted to better understand where these folks were coming from. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that here, too, 
And I'll outline uh, briefly, without belaboring the details you know, of the study, I'll outline briefly what we found out in, in a study that we did that, that tried to get us closer to understanding where people were relative to the sights and sounds of logging, not just the aftermath of logging. So we, we, we refer to it as logging in progress. And I think when we're talking about logging in progress, there are some principles before we get into the study that we conducted. There's some principles we can talk about, I think, or some ideas we can talk about that, um, that might be useful. And, and, and most good loggers and foresters and landowners are aware of this. You know, one is, you know, I put, tried to encapsulate it in the phrase, understanding the neighborhood. You know, what is the neighborhood? Where are the neighbors? What are, what's their opinion of logging? How can, we, how can we go about timber harvesting in such a way that allays some of the concerns people may have about, about timber harvesting? Um, I, my first job before entering academia is I worked for uh, Fred Bickford. If you're from New Hampshire, maybe Vermont, you may have known Fred. He's retired now. I worked for him as a chopper and skidder in the Sandwich area. So we're in an area that's sort of sandwiched between Squam Lake and Winnipesaukee. A lot of people, a lot of recreationists, a lot of people who aren't from New Hampshire, a lot of people from urban areas who recreate in those areas, a lot of parcelization. Um, a lot of land use change, if you're familiar with that whole area, Meredith, Center Harbor, all through there. That's what, that was where Fred logged, and that's when I worked for Fred for about three years. That's where we logged, and we had to understand the neighborhood there. This was different from working in northern Maine, where perhaps people would not see us very often or hear us. We were often in people's dooryards, and I think understanding the neighborhood, which Fred did very well, and we behaved accordingly, um, is a really important important thing. We can't disregard that there are neighbors around. We were whole tree chipping too, and those people who are in forestry and logging and know about whole tree chipping, starting up that chipper in the morning, you know, when when you do that, everyone's awake. When you once you do that, and so you need to understand that and and adjust accordingly. So understanding the neighborhood, things like noise, speed of of vehicles, and just sort of courtesies. Talking to a logger here, for example. Um, about um, this is Seaway timber harvesting out of Messina works on some of the the Paul Smith lands here. We have about 12,000 acres in forest lands that we own and manage here at Paul Smith. Uh, he makes sure that he stops by the, the the neighbors and lets them know what what he's going to be doing before he does it. Um, he has told me that he's delivered a free of charge firewood to the to their dooryards just to make sure that they understood that that he knew that they were there and he appreciated that um, this might be a sort of a temporary inconvenience for them to have sort of a noisy operation in their dooryard and and so that's one of the things that he did. Uh, Shorner is asking what did we do um, and we're going to get to that in a second but among the things that we and others do are or uh, think about things like timing, you know, time of day, making sure that if it's a whole tree chipping operation, even though you'd like to start at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., uh, depending on where you're located, that may not be a good idea, or it may be a good idea to put aside those logging chances that are in heavily recreated areas to a time of year when the recreation use is fairly low. Day of the week may, differ may make a difference. Um, you know, of course, when you're a logger or a forester connected to any kind of logging operation, but you're looking at whole tree chipping where the investment is in the millions of dollars, oftentimes you want to be able to pay for your equipment and make a profit. And oftentimes, sometimes for, for us, that meant um, logging seven days a week, sometimes 10 hours a day. But we adjusted that all, as well as, as, and as others do based on sort of the flow of community life around that particular logging chance. And so I think that's important, uh, understanding the neighborhood, understanding you're going to be making noise um, and that that may inconvenience people, that, that there are going to be trucks entering and leaving your logging operations. So speed's an issue. We had that on our, on our road recently on Keys Mills Road, where I live here in Paul Smith, where speed was an issue. And uh, folks on the, in the neighborhood spoke to the logger, and he understood, and he changed his behavior, not only in terms of when he was trucking, because he was trucking fairly early, in the morning, but also the speed with which he was traveling uh, Keys Mills Road, where there are a number of families with children, and and he he showed he demonstrated his professionalism, I believe, by by uh, by adjusting accordingly, uh, coming in a little bit later, trucking at different times, making sure that the truck drivers knew that they were running through neighborhoods that uh, where there was some concerns about um, the speed of the of the trucks uh, related to to their families. These are avenues of public exposure, by the way, when we talk about, it's a term that we use anyway, when we talk about landings and, and trails and haul roads and skid trails. These are places where the public goes and, 
if the land's not posted, where they're going to go is where the trails are typically and where the landings are. So making sure that that those landings and trails are are free of debris and 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 free of obstacles is kind of important because that's what that's what the public's going to see, and uh, that's kind of important. So there's a number of different things, sort of conceptually, you know, understanding the neighborhood timing, understanding that these are avenues of public exposure. That um, if we keep that in mind and and sort of act accordingly, at the same time trying to fulfill the, the objectives and trying to make to make money, um, if timber is being extracted, um, and that's one of the objectives. Um, so, so balancing that is is very difficult. But I think the more that we that we uh, understand that we're working in in oftentimes in other people's neighborhoods, um, then uh, and behave accordingly, then I think we're going to be okay. Uh, but that's it's not easy. Uh, and then there are other other considerations related to mul multiple use, and perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit later. So understanding the neighborhood uh, when we're talking about logging and progress in particular. Um, briefly on the study that we conducted when we were looking at logging and progress, it was a group selection harvest at the University of Maine in the experimental forest near the Witter Farm, if you're familiar with, uh, with the University of Maine. The Witter Farm is in, in Old Town and proximate to uh, the, the college Witter Farm, the University Witter Farm, um, in an area that's, that's somewhat suburban, you know, between Old Town and Orono. So it was a group selection harvest. Uh, we, we had some trials uh, where we put out uh, several different logging methods, that is equipment, yarding methods, and wanted to see, see w uh, what uh, some of the effects were related to things like soil compaction, which we used uh, soil bug density to, to estimate residual stand damage and costs. But those are aside from aesthetics. We were also looking at aesthetics, but we wanted to make sure that we, we looked at aesthetics in the context of other um, forest values and not just look at aesthetics alone, but said, okay, aesthetically, yes, the public may prefer something, but you know the reality is some of the preferences that the public may have may impinge more on soil bulk, bulk density, residual stand damage, and the cost of the operation. So we're trying to to provide some context to this and not look at aesthetics in isolation. Control for things like stand type, soil culture, which was, again, group selection harvest. The experience and training of the operators, which is critical because, you know, a 440 in one person's hands will behave differently from a skitter, a 440 skitter in someone else's hands. And so we needed to control, we felt, for the experience and training of the operators. Uh, and so just to give you a sense of what we tried to do, set up these trials, uh, looked at several different types of equipment, um, uh, a skitter, a farm tractor, um, a forder, and a, um, a dozer, a small bulldozer, is a 350, John Deere 350 for those people who track on that, and then a draft horse. Okay, so we're looking at four tractive methods. That's the skitter, the tractor, the horse, and the dozer, and one, tra one non-tractive method. That is one method that doesn't drag wood, and that's the forder. All ground-based, though, all common in the state of Maine and then the nor and sort of the uh, northern New England. We know they're common in northern New England because a couple of years prior to this, we had, we had done a survey of loggers among the questions we asked is, what equipment are you using? Um, actually, very few are using horses. Uh, less than 4% were use of the logging businesses had had anything to do with small-scale logging, including horses. Most were skidders, though, and a lot of them, um, some of you may be surprised, were cable skidders rather than grapple skidders. Uh, but we wanted to certainly use that equipment, which was common to the area. And uh, we put them in these trials at the Witter Farm, uh, again, controlling for silviculture and um, controlling for the site and the stands, um, and filmed them. And we filmed them at near views and far views. We tried to pick views from 6 to 100 feet. These are views we thought that a passerby might, might have... Um, um, when they were just passing by a logging operation, we tried to get, we, we captured the sound and the sight. We tried to make sure that we were shooting in the same direction, with the same background, same time of day, uh, same season of the year. We did this all within about a two-week period, um, I believe it was in uh, late July and early August, in order to control for some of these, some of the, some of the confounding elements. Took the videotape. And then um, this is Mike Eckley um, actually doing the videotaping along with um, a videographer from the University of Maine video group, um, the professionals there. So taped them, controlling, controlling for whatever we could, and then edited the couple of hours, I think as I recall, of, of videography down to about a 13-minute video survey. 
and then gave the video survey to um, or conducted the video survey with a, a cross-section of the general public. Again, trying to figure out, what, okay, what about logging in progress, the sights and sounds of logging? Did people prefer and what, was, what were things that they did not prefer? So here's, I'll get into some results in a second, but I think what I'd like to do is kind of play here in the uh, upper left of my screen anyway, some of the videography that we produced and then edited down. Here it's edited down to about four minutes. Um, this is not the video survey, but it is the, these are the images that the people who took the survey uh, saw. Embedded among these images and between these images would be, would be survey questions. I did not include those questions here. The entire survey was about 13 minutes including the questions and the time it took for, for people to answer those and respond to those questions. Um, uh, but what I've done here is reduce this to just the four minutes of the sights and sounds of the, f of the five different yarding methods that we focused on here. And I see, it looks like Peter's expanding this for me. I hope that's okay, just the way it is. Uh, we can expand it a little bit further if we need to Let's expand it this way. So you're going to hear some things here too. I just just as a heads up, um, we've reduced the sound levels uh, because we didn't want the survey participants to be exposed to the same sound levels that they'd be exposed to if they were 60 feet away from, for example, a skitter or a forwarder. But we reduced them proportionate to each other. So for example, if the skitter was the loud, loudest in in actuality when we were taking the video, um, it was still the loudest when we showed showed the uh, administered the test but it was still the loudest proportionate to the other, the, the noises, the sounds that were being made by the, the, the other five, the other four methods. I hope that's understandable, not too confusing. So let's take a look at this and you get a sense over the next four minutes as to, as to what we did. Uh, started with the, uh, with the forward. So it's gonna start here. And this is what the video participants again you. And we tried to make sure that each one of the different, the five different yardy methods that we used were, were essentially um, involved in the same yarding function. So going into the woods empty, uh, hooking wood or loading wood on the back of the, of the forwarder, then transporting the wood, and then landing the wood. So we wanted to make sure that all of those elements, in that case I've just talked about four different elements, were portrayed in each one of the, of the five different yarding methods. So that we weren't trying to skew this in one direction or another. So this is the, essentially the, the turn element, that is returning to the landing, and now the unloading or decking element. And we'll see this in the other four So now the skitter. As I mentioned earlier, we tried to we tried to control for the experience of and training of the operators. All these operators were had had gone through the certified logging professionals program. A couple of them were master loggers, but we wanted to make sure that at a minimum they all had the voluntary uh, CLP certification. That way, we did our best. To control Of course, one of the issues here is we were looking at classes of yarding equipment. Um, and within each class, there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of variability in size. There's a lot of variability in muffling. There's a lot of variability in engine size. And so the first cut at this was for us to look at classes of yarding methods uh, rather than at trying to tease out all the different varieties and variabilities you know, within each, within any one class. Uh, so that's something we need to follow up on and realize that we need to, before we even start the study, that, we, that looking within the class is going to be important too. So this is sort of the first cut at looking at the sights and sounds of logging. Now a farm tractor. And then the last one will be a horse. As it turns out, um, uh, it was very difficult to find a horse logger in that area um, who could conduct these trials for us. Um, at the time, I owned two draft mares and was horse logging in the area. I had been horse logging for some years. And so we used my horse um, to, to capture some of the video of the horse logging. So you see my gray mare and 
Same idea though, same back, same background, essentially the same yarding functions being done by by the horse, and I was the driver for this particular videotape. Uh, but the same idea, returning into the woods empty, uh, maneuvering to hook up wood, hooking wood to the horse, uh, dragging it to the landing, and then yarding the wood, just as we were doing with the other other methods. So we'll see this through. And it's obvious the horse is, is the quietest of the of the yarding methods, and so that obviously plays in, in uh, a role here. Okay, so I think we get the idea there. A couple of questions have come up here, one from Todd asking, do, do I feel that there's a future for the draft animal? Um, he raises shires in Ohio. He's looking for some opportunities. I think, there, I think, there's, I think there's a sort of a steady demand. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a growing demand. My sense is that as we have an expanding urban fridge and fringe and more and more exurbanization and parcelization too as, as the woodlots become smaller and smaller i think we'll see at least a steady demand for horse logging um, for those reasons especially you know look at parcelization and the work that dave kittredge did at umass and as those as those tracks those harp those forested tracks becomes smaller and smaller becomes more and more expensive um, per board foot or per ton or whatever it is to move big equipment in but you can move a horse in for a much less cost there's a downside to horse logging. You know, as a, horse, a former horse logger, I don't have my mares anymore. I could tell you that this, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I'm sure Todd can attest to that. Um, it's probably the least safe way to log, only because you and the horse are exposed uh, to anything that might fall from above versus having a falling ob object protective structure over any of the other pieces of equipment. I think there's, I think, I think there's a niche. You know, I think there's a niche, and uh, finding a horse logger is, is oftentimes the the challenge that people have. Sometimes there are a couple in a particular sort of neighborhood, and sometimes there aren't that many around. And so, um, and so it's that's going to be uh, that's going to be part of the challenge. And it's dangerous. Someone, Colleen says, slightly dangerous to the person controlling the horse, and it's certainly certainly more dangerous than sitting in a skitter most of the time too. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to it. I don't want to get too too distracted by horse logging here. I think maybe that's a, a subject for. A future webinar, people feel that that's a good uh, a good topic to discuss. Uh, but some good questions and comments from a, a number of different people on horse logging, and maybe we can get to some of them those at, toward the end of the discussion <clears throat> and talk about that a little bit. Um, but I'd like to, for now anyway, move on and and kind of talk a little bit more about some of the results of this study. Uh, these are people now, uh, the general public who took the video survey. You saw essentially you saw the images and heard the sounds that they heard and saw and, re and they responded to, to questions. And I just highlighted a couple of what I think are some of the key findings here. Um, respondents prefer the sights and sound of smaller methods. And I think that's, you know, maybe that's intuitive. Maybe we, what we found out empirically was what most people would have guessed intuitively. Uh, but this is, again, a cross-section of the general public, most of whom had very little exposure to timber harvesting. And so seeing a large forder, for example, in a, operating in a woodlot, was was a little perhaps off-putting to them. Uh, at the same time, though, the respondents recognized most of them recognized that the forwarder was more efficient because they asked them their impressions of which they which method they thought would be the most efficient. So even though they might have said that they thought the forwarder was most efficient, they still said they preferred the sights and sounds of the smaller methods. In particular, for a lot of folks, and in particular, uh, gender was a was an explanatory variable here for the females. Um, in the group, uh, we found significant differences between males and females in their preference for horse logging, with, with females respondents being much more um, uh, enthused about, uh, about horse logging and the sights and sounds of horse logging over other methods. Um, we asked respondents about what they would prefer in a residential area, and again, they preferred the horse and the tractor methods, mainly because of their size and the hour roll, the, the noise values associated with the horse and the tractor methods over the other methods. Forder, again, based on his size, was, was the least preferred. Um, let's see if I have some comments here. Economics is a drawback, so we're going to get to that, and we could talk about economics. I can, you know, I can tell you firsthand about some of the economics of horse logging. If you don't like doing it, 
um, for example, uh, it's 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 not a very economical way of of going about logging. Uh, you have to enjoy doing it, and typically the landowner, uh, in in a lot of cases, has to accept uh, less for their for the, either their stumpage or for uh, as a service. If the logger is providing a service, they have to pay more for the service because it it is a lot slower, and the costs of horse logging are a lot higher per unit on the on the uh, on the landing. So some ideas there on some of the key findings. Uh, I'll let you read some of the others. Um, and then uh, we did look at residual stand effects. So we wanted to keep this in, in, in context and look at, okay, yeah, aesthetics is important here. You'll notice, though, that horses are not part of this because I, couldn't, I could not spend the amount of time it would take uh, to log a several hectares um, in the summer uh, for, this particular, um, for this particular experiment that we did at the University of Maine. So the horse, we don't have results for residual stand effects for the horse. I can give you some some anecdotal information on horse logging and residual stand effects, but even but I want to talk about these other four methods anyway. These the, these uh, mechanical methods. Um, yes, uh, the forder perhaps did not score as high as a as um, as uh, in terms of aesthetics and aesthetic values, uh, but when you when you look at um, the forder, there are some values here that may not accrue to, to aesthetics, but might accrue to other things. For example, in our study, anyway, the least damage in the stand proximate to the harvested groups. We talked about group selection earlier. Least damage per 100 meters of uh, 100 square meters of uh, near trail space, but had the widest trails. Okay, so uh, so the trails are wider. Whether that's um, an issue for landowners or others or not, that's that's really sometimes a, a subjective judgment on the on the part of the landowner that you're going to need wider trails. Then you're going to need for the horse logger, for example, to get out the same amount of wood. But with horses, you still have to get to the wood, right? So you're still going to have to have the trails. They may be narrower. Uh, a disadvantage of the horse here is that the horse has to go right up to the wood. And it doesn't, you know, it's, it's difficult to carry around with you if you're horse logging a winch, so you can snake wood out the way you could with a skitter or the way you could with a with a bulldozer or a tractor. So you do have to get to the wood, and um, so the horse. Even though it may seem like it has some aesthetic values and other values over some of the other methods, um, has some disadvantages here too. Um, most damage uh, to tree bowls for 100 meters of tra near trail space was for the bulldozer in this case, uh, had also had the most severe root damage and the smallest affected corridor. So even though it's a small piece of equipment in the, in the bulldozer that we use, this small John Deere 350, there was the most damage, probably related to the fact that the arch for that skitter is the lowest among the, the different methods that we use that were dragging wood. And so we could not lift the wood. The operator couldn't lift the wood as high as it might otherwise. So uh, we, our sense was that that, was, that explains a lot of the damage that, we, that was incurred by the, by the bulldozer. That is, yeah, it's small, but, but arch height's really critical here. Okay, so in context, Horse looked good, maybe the forwarder didn't look as good, but the forwarder looks a little bit better when we're starting to look at other values like residual stand effects and even soil effects. Uh, we have the widest trail still, but we have the least soil compaction. So big piece of equipment uh, that might be a little off-putting to a lot of observers uh, when they're looking at a logging operation and sort of deciding about the aesthetic values associated with a particular piece of equipment like a forwarder. Uh, but there are trade-offs here. And I think we need to understand the trade-offs, and the landowners need to understand them. And to, what, to whatever degree we can, we need to perhaps inform the general public about some of the trade-offs. Uh, because not all the wood is going to be managed or, or harvested by horses. We know that. There aren't enough horses in the world to get the management that we need to, to, to do on, on a lot of management. As Here I'm equating management with something related to timber harvesting. There aren't enough horses to do that, so we have to look at some of these other pieces of equipment. Some of the other pieces of equipment actually have have a, have a lot of distinct advantages and other values. Again, greatest soil compaction um, was with, in this case, with the tractor um, for the work that we had to do, and it was greater than 10% increase in soil bulk density for both the tractor and the dozer. And the reason I put that in there is that research has shown as you increase soil bulk density over background soil bulk density, uh, over inherent soil bulk density by 10%, you start to decrease the productivity in terms of the height of the seedlings that come in afterwards. And so it's a sort of a threshold that uh, the, the literature has, has suggested is an important threshold. And in, in the case of both the dozer and the tractor, um, they exceeded that threshold. 
uh, the, the fort or did not, but we needed wider trails. A um, couple of different comments here. Uh, Paul is saying there will be more overall disturbance of the soil when using horses. And I think in a lot of ways that's right. Um, there are some studies, we didn't study this, but there are some studies out there that show that the horse has greater compaction, is greater compaction under a horse's hoof. You're talking about a, an animal that's, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. And that, that 2,000 pounds is, is centered on a hoof, you know, the size, if you open up your hand, about the size of your hand and that there's a, a lot of studies have shown greater compactive forces from the horse than, than, for example, bulldozer, where the weight of the bulldozer is distributed over a much wider base uh, on the tracks. And so that's a good comment, and that's been shown in other places too. Uh, concern about management on steep slopes regarding equipment access. Um, Carl's asking about that. What's the effect of arch height specifically? Um, arch height, you know, the, the higher the arch, Everything else being equal, the higher the arch, the less is being dragged in a tractive system. And the less you drag, typically, the less effect you're going to have on, on soil disturbance. And we have shown, uh, we think, um, that we're going to have less effect on soil bulk density as we increase the arch height. So that's important. Turning radius is important. Nick is, is asking about turning radius. That's obviously important. Um, and the turning radius of the, of the forward was actually pretty good. I, I, we did quantify that. I don't have that information in front of me. I have two graduate students working on this, and we're working on a couple of papers that bring in turning radius. But Nick makes a good point about turning radius and residual stand damage and other effects. Um, the bulldozer, even though the weight of the bulldozer is distributed over a track, the bulldozer then pivots on that track rather than turns as it's, as it's moving forward the way a, 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 a skitter does. And we feel that some of the, some of the soil bulk density effects that we saw coming from the from the bulldozer were related to the fact that it had to pivot on that track there and maybe pounding the compaction in that area. Um, I won't spend too much more time on soil effects here, but again, the, the idea here was to look at, okay, we can look at aesthetics, but if we look at aesthetics in, in a vacuum and not think of other effects or other values, I don't think we have as much good knowledge to work from. And then cost and productivity, finally. Um, if you look at the, the largest piece of equipment, it was also the lowest cost per unit on the landing. Even though this is a large piece of equipment, we're looking at things like machine rates. Machine rates, machine rates are in a way of estimating the, the operating and owning costs of equipment over its useful life. And I don't want to get into the details of that because I think we might, we might get uh, sidetracked a little bit too much. But when we also evaluated the cost, because we were collecting daily information from from the operators and also had a stopwatch on all this all this equipment. We found that uh, we had the largest volume per cycle with the forwarder, fewer cycles, that is fewer turns to get the same amount of wood. I think that's really critical here when we're talking about residual stand damage and damage to the soil is that this piece of equipment is making fewer turns. It's also going to be in and out of the tract a lot faster. And so the time that, that the general public is exposed to a harvesting operation is compressed. If you have a horse in there, then the horse is going to be there much longer than anything else that we've studied. Of course, people, so a lot of people like to see horses yard wood. Uh, but uh, there were some comments from some survey participants who said, who viewed horse logging as cruel. And so you have to deal with that too. You know, this, this whole animal cruelty idea, which is certainly, uh, you know, something that needs to be negotiated. Um, and so cost and productivity are important to, to bring in here. Probably if we had the horse in here, my guess is that would have the highest cost per unit of production on the landing with the horse. So that's been shown at, from other studies. Whether we would have shown it or not, I, ha I, I can't say, but my guess is we may have shown something like that. Um, in this case, the bulldozer had the highest repair costs, highest yarding costs. That's the highest cost per production per thousand board feet on the landing. So there's a tr there are trade-offs here, I guess is what we're saying when we're looking at sort of logging in progress and the aesthetics associated with it. Um, and um, and that's those those trade-offs need to be evaluated and negotiated, and, and a decision needs to be made. A lot of good questions. The questions about more detail on turning radius, skitter and dozer with higher arch can pivot on a shorter section of drag log. When you have most of the log on the ground, it becomes difficult to turn. This is from Nick, who's really tracking on this. That's good. And, and for right now, Nick, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave that to the end and uh, see if we can have a discussion on that and make sure that we are hitting on, on as many aesthetic issues as we can. Um, and then Martin's talking about the impact of the horse dependent on the amount of timber being extracted. That's true. 
uh, can be useful for scarifying, preparing seed beds. That's true. I mean, this this whole idea of of uh, soil disturbance. It works. It cuts in a lot of different directions, right? So a lot of times you want soil disturbance. You may not want heavy-duty compaction because ultimately, if you get too much compaction, research has shown that you may drive the productivity of the site down. And we were really looking at compaction rather than just soil disturbance. But if you're looking for white pine regeneration or yellow birch regeneration, for example, just to pick two species common in the Northeast that need sort of a disturbed seedbed. Um, that that type of scarification can be very useful, and we, we actually try to get more scarification. But getting back to aesthetics for a moment here, uh, so responses. The responses I think come in different categories. Maybe we can, you know, it's to try to understand this. Maybe we can put these the responses in boxes like planning, supervi supervision, communication, contracting. Is it part of the contract that aesthetics are being are going to be um, dealt with and attended to? I've seen contracts when I worked for uh, Kearsarge Reel in Warner, New Hampshire. It doesn't exist anymore, but we had contracts. It was a, uh, a large sawmill in central New Hampshire in Warner. Um, uh, we had contracts that, that specified that the logger had to keep slash at a, at a particular level and other elements that dealt with aesthetic values associated with the logging operation. If that's important to the landowner, then those should be stipulated in the contract. Of course, the issue we have in the northeast, in some northeastern states, that we we often don't have written contracts, and we often don't have a forester involved in the in the harvest, and that's that can be problematic, obviously. But contracting can be part of this. How how the job is supervised by by an agent of of the landowner, whether it be a forester or someone else, and the communication that takes place among the the, the forester and uh, the logger and the, and the landowner to get what the landowner wants, uh, not only uh, in terms of the timber that's being extracted and the money that, that comes from that, the revenue that comes from that from the land, for the landowner, but also other values. And if aesthetics is a value that needs to be communicated somehow. Um, hiring, in my opinion, hiring professional foresters and professional loggers, however that's defined. Now, professional foresters is defined different ways in different states. And w what a professional logger is, is defined by different people in different ways too, but certainly there are certifications um, that accrue to both of those professions in different states. And seeking out people who are certified in some way, I think, um, helps define the the work that you're going to get at the other end. And so, and other work that we and others have done have shown that when BMPs, that is best management practices, are uh, are investigated, we have found that when a professional logger is involved. In the in a timber sale, that BMPs are more likely to be to be initiated and uh, completed on sites, um, and that contracts, for example, did not predict that to the degree to which professional forester involvement did, um, and so the the value of having a professional forester can't be can't be underestimated. Um, what exactly is slash? Mike is asking. Slash. This is logging debris that's left over after a logging operation is completed. So it's often topwood, branch wood, and topwood that's not typically not merchantable, especially if if the markets are for roundwood. If the markets, if there are biomass markets, oftentimes there is very little, if any, slash left over. But it's it's logging debris and tops. Neil has answered the question. So thanks for for heading me off. Um, uh, okay, it's a couple other questions here, and, and uh, I'll try to answer them as they're popping up. Term I use for a final harvest on a tract that will no longer be used for forest management in Maine. In New Hampshire, this came out of work that was done by Sarah Thorne when she was with the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. They coined the term terminal harvest, which I thought was a good term, and I've used it quite a bit since then, and other people have borrowed it. Um, it's a little bit different from Maine's term. Maine uses liquidation harvest, and there's, there was talk about legislation controlling liquidation harvesting in Maine. Uh, liquidation harvesting is a little bit different. It doesn't necessarily Im imply that there's going to be a land use change away from future harvesting. Um, and I don't want to get into all the sort of the nuanced ways that liquidation harvesting can be described, but uh, some of that's on the Maine Forest Service website, if you want to go to the Maine Forest Service website. But again, getting back to aesthetics for a, for a second, uh, I think some of the things we talked about, supervision, contracting, hiring professionals to help you if you're a landowner. Uh, forester and logger training, the types of things we're talking about right now, we're all learning. I'm learning from your comments. Hopefully, you're, you're going to be able to take something away from, from what we've done here this, this, this afternoon as well. And then landowner education. Um, obviously, the role of extension, and Peter and Shorna and Rich are all intimately involved in this, as are people like Jim Finley in Pennsylvania and uh, 
um, Bob Edmonds and others in, in New Hampshire and other places, they're, they're uh, directly linked to these communities, the, forest, the forestry community, the logging community, landowner community. Essentially, when we get right down to it, it's all one community trying to, trying to do the best we can to, to uh, steward the, the, the um, forests that we're, they were charged to steward. But that's important, too. Uh, other responses that are could be civil cultural, uh, so-called deferment harvests, for example. This is these are harvests that came out of research and started in Germany, oh, some 20 years ago. There was research done on deferment harvests in West Virginia. I think it was Clay Smith and others. We did a little bit when I was at West Virginia University on deferment harvests as well. A deferment harvest, uh, essentially, as it came from Germany, was uh, an, a, a so-called aesthetic alternative to clear cutting. The idea that people did not like clear cutting, but how can we engage in even age management? Uh, without clear cutting, but essentially try to get a, approximate the same results. Um, when you look at it, and this is a picture, um, a, an image of uh, deferment harvest of a research we were doing at West Virginia University of a deferment harvest in an oak stand um, near Morgantown, West Virginia. Looks like a sea tree harvest, or something, you know, maybe the second stage of a shelterwood harvest. Essentially, a deferment harvest means that you're going to you're going to leave some trees on the site, so it's not going to be a clear cut. You're going to open up the stand to the degree to which it's it's a fairly it's it's approximates a clear cut environment, but there are deferment trees on the site that can be recovered a little bit later. So a lot of in a lot of ways, it, it looks like um, a reserve sea tree, I guess, where we, you might go back in and, and and get the trees. I guess what what distinguishes it from a sea tree harvest is that the idea behind it, the objective, isn't regeneration so much as it is aesthetics. And so practices like deferment harvests, for example. Uh, thinnings, because we are looking for visual penetrations, uh, maybe in some cases. Um, we found that a lot of people like visual penetration, so thinning from below would accomplish that, if, that's, if that makes sense given some of the other silvicultural objectives that the landowner and the forester may have for a particular tract. And then biomass removal. Um, biomass removal cuts in a lot of different ways, but uh, biomass removal typically results in a lot of visual penetration. Uh, there may be a downside here. We're still looking at sort of the ecological benefits and costs of biomass removal and removing all that slash and then chipping it. So maybe there are some compromises we may, we may make here and leave some slash behind so that that can degenerate or uh, reincorporate into the, into the soil over time. Uh, but silvicultural practices. So management practices, yes, some things we need to think about. Civil cultural practices like deferment harvest, for example, uh, that is an aesthetic alternative to, to clear cutting and maintaining even age management at the same time, thinning for visual penetration, biomass removal for visual penetration and for other, other benefits, for example. Um, let's move forward a little bit here so we get through all this. Um, logging practices, equipment selection is important, obviously. Um, I put paying more cable here. What, what I mean by that is that. Um, uh, if, you're, if you've operated a skitter before uh, for any length of time, you, you know that the, the most energy that you're going to put into, into your work day is going, to be, is going to be essentially pulling cable, if it's a cable skitter. Um, but there's benefits here, right? So if, you, if you're not paying a lot of cable, if you're not pulling a lot of cable and lot, letting some cable out to reach trees, that means you're backing up to every, every felled tree. If you're backing up to every felled tree, the chances of your... Um, having more residual stand damage, which has, you know, has repercussions from the standpoint of not only aesthetics, but for the future of the productivity of the stand, are much higher. And so, and so paying cable here, this is a management issue, but it's also a behavioral issue when you're in the skitter. And, um, and it, it is the hardest thing to do if you're the skitter operator, because you get, you, you're out, you're pulling cable out, you're setting chokers, and then you're, getting, you're walking back to the skitter and getting back into the skitter. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing that for 50 hours a week, you know, it is a lot. So, but paying more cable can help, or pulling more cable to get to trees rather than to backing up to all the trees that are felled, um, has, has, some, has some potential benefits from the standpoint of aesthetic, aesthetics and other values. Larger payloads per cycle, you know, research we've done and other people have done and shown that the, more, the fewer turns that you make, that is the fewer cycles that you make or trips in the woods you make for the same amount of wood, the less re residual stand damage you're going to have. And residual stand damage, again, is related to not only aesthetics, but to other forest values. So larger payloads per cycle. It's easy for a skitter operator, for example, sometime to come in, sometimes to go in and, and make a quick turnaround, pick up a couple of trees and then come out 
but have chokers that aren't completely filled. You might go in with five chokers and come back with three filled chokers. Sometimes it takes some time and work and planning, though, to actually bunch an entire turn together. So you have, you have a max, you've maximized your payload for a particular tract um, over time. And if you're maximizing your payload, you're making fewer turns, theoretically. And if you're making th fewer turns, there's less opportunity for residual stand damage. And again, the effects of residual stand damage on aesthetics. I've oversimplified that, you know, so there's behavioral issues here, um, but um, just to kind of throw that out. So to summarize, lots of stat strategies and practices. You folks have some, have a lot of good ideas. I've seen a lot of them come up, and hopefully we can get to some more of them. Lots of strategies and practices for, for uh, maintaining aesthetic values. Uh, many are consistent with other aspects of what normally we consider good forest management anyway, like maximum utilization of stump heights are an issue, and we want to reduce stump heights or reduce the amount of slash that's left behind. We want to maximize utilization. A lot of BMPs um, talk about aesthetic values. Uh, but we also, also know there's some trade-offs potentially between uh, aesthetic values and other forest values. We, we talked about those and talked about the study that we did that, that maybe um, talked, you know, discussed and maybe shed some light on some of those. Here's a comment that was out of a, an article by Meacham in, in the year 2000. I'll give you the citation of that at the end. I believe Meacham is from the U.S. Forest Service. And to me, this sort of encapsulizes what this is all about that we're talking about. And, and this I, I will read word for word because I, I like what Meacham said. He said, he, you know, it's all about fitting operational activities into the tempo of community life. We talked about understanding the neighborhood rather than depending on the community to adjust to contemporary operational inconveniences. There are trade-offs here, and, and, and we all know as, as forest managers and others and, and, uh, and loggers and, and forest land owners that you know, we have a right to, to, to do the timber harvesting if it's done in a way that doesn't compromise other values or other or regulations related to the Clean Water Act, for example. Um, but it, it only makes sense to, when we can, to make sure that we try to fit our, oper our activities into the tempo of community, li and community life rather than just going in and figuring, you know, we can, we can turn on our equipment at, at any time, at any season of the year, any time of day, any day of the week, and, and expect that, that people are going to think that's okay. A lot of times they think it's okay, but the problem is that we have more and we have expanding urban fringe and expanding exurban population that maybe doesn't understand timber harvesting. And ultimately, uh, they're going to they're going to have a say into what we can and can't do. Here are some publications that have been referenced. Um, the Meacham publications, the third bullet down. If you're interested in that, there's a lot of of information out there on in the scientific and and uh, the more accessible literature that on on aesthetics. And I'd I'd, I'd really uh, um, encourage you to to pursue some of that. This is only this is a, a short uh, sort of a short list. The study that I alluded to earlier was published, part of it was published in the Journal of Forestry. That's the first bullet. And this, these are here alphabetically. So some of the, some of the publications that have been referenced. Uh, and then now we're open to some discussion. Um, and I'm going to go through, we don't have that much time left. I guess we're looking at just a few more minutes before I get the hook here from Peter, I guess. Um, but um, let's see what we've got. Um, uh, let's see. Peter's about to send me a message here. Oh, it's expanding the chat. That's great. Uh, so, Carl, we have a lot of arboretums in Southeast PA. I know Carl came in earlier and said that he works in a lot of urban forestry um, and that um, they are very concerned about forest management aesthetics. Um, and these are t just a couple places to name a few. And I can say that, for example, the Meacham article, Meacham did work in Maryland and I think on a, on a, uh, in urban forestry. And he was the one, based on the work that he did, that was suggesting the niche, the strong niche that persists in that area where he was working for horse logging, because it is quiet. Again, there's a downside with horse logging. Horse logging isn't a panacea. We note that in the article that we published. And um, it's not a panacea. There's, a, there's some downsides here, too. But uh, there's, no, there's no quick and easy solution here. And there are trade-offs in almost every solution. So, um, so that's, that's important to keep in mind. Um, Okay, Jen Hacking, moderate amount. What reper repercussions exist for NIPF owners in Northeast US who ignore aesthetics and concerns of neighbors, noise, timing of operations? You know, you know, when I think about this, not only as someone who was logging and then practicing forestry, but now, you know, teaching our students about timber harvesting here, I said, you know, we all vote. And uh, you know, I was in the state of Maine for seven years 
on the faculty there, and, and we vote a lot by direct uh, democracy there. It's referenda. And if people don't like what we're doing, um, you know, in, in states like Maine and, and Oregon, that where the politics is often driven by direct democracies like uh, and mechanisms of de direct democracy like um, like referenda, it won't happen over time. You know, things there'll, there'll be more and more legislation and regulations that will constrain what we can do. And I think the more we can get out in front of that and define the environment that we think works for ourselves rather than have other people define it for us, in my opinion, again. I think the better off we're going to be, and um, and I think that those are the risks you run if you ignore aesthetics, in my opinion, because what what drives people crazy in the general public about forestry and and forest management and harvesting, um, and I think there's some studies have shown this is not the, eco the ecological effects or what whether the civil culture is the right civil culture, it's what they see and what they hear, and if we don't if we don't attend to that, I think. I think we 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 ignored at our own peril that we're t we're taking that risk. You can disagree with me on that one, or you know, or anything that I've I've talked about here today. But that you know, that's my opinion on that. Um, let's see, there's other things here. There's some some good comments that I think you all can read. Um, Peter, are we are we doing okay on time? I'm looking at maybe three more minutes if we're going to yep. try to wrap. Yeah, it up we have about three time. more minutes, and then we need okay. to clear the site for another webinar. Okay, Richard Carey, cable skidding less damaging than grapple skidding. In a lot of ways, I agree with that because with a cable skidder, skidder, you can be more surgical, right? With a grapple skidder, you have to back up to every load. The difference, though, is a cable a grapple skidder is usually following a feller buncher or some other mechanized felling up felling um, piece of equipment that can lay down wood in such a way that can reduce residual stand damage too, right? And so there's you know there's a couple of ways to to cut the sort of the cable skidder versus grapple skidder. Uh, argument relative to residual stand damage. Yeah, cable skidder is more surgical, but they're typically following a chainsaw, right? Uh, chainsaw felling is less surgical sometimes than feller buncher operation is, but of course, they're, the, the man or woman running the chainsaw takes up less space than the feller buncher, so you have to get a, a larger feller buncher in there to do the work. So certainly some trade-offs here, but we can we can discuss that. Uh, in in uh, and probably take many hours to discuss the, the 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 advantages and disadvantages of cable skidding versus grapple skidding. But I, I I agree with you. I think you can be more surgical with a uh, with a with a, a cable skidder. Some value there and still used a lot in Vermont, for example, in New Hampshire um, and parts of Maine. You know, the cable skidder hasn't gone away. Richard Carey, I agree regarding cable skidder is okay if it's picking up bunch logs, but not okay if to each log. I agree with that. And when you have a grapple skidder following, you know, uh, um, wood that's not bunched, let's say hand felled wood, chainsaw felled wood, I th you know, in a lot of ways you're asking for trouble. And, um, Todd's thanking us for the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, folks, for all your great comments. Um, I wish we can get to all of them uh, and uh, and and really spend a little bit more time. Uh, but I hope I hope you got something out of it. I think if 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 anything else, it it just uh, it, it, it reaffirms what I think a lot of you already know and what, what a lot of a lot of things you're already doing and a lot of a lot of ways you're already thinking and um, if there's something new that came out of this for you too that's useful that's great too but um, I appreciate all your comments and uh, the good questions you you've asked and uh, hope hope uh, maybe to, to touch bases with you again on this sometime well Andy this was a great presentation thank you and the audience the participants were um, I think as uh, interactive as we've ever had on a webinar, so that that speaks well to the to the quality of your presentation that you're able to draw them uh, into the discussion. Um, we do need to uh, think about wrapping this up with just a couple of quick comments. If you would all please just quickly hit that hot link in the top center of your screen for the exit survey, uh, that'll take you to a a relatively short it takes just a couple of minutes but it provides us essential data that we use to document impacts um, and and we depend upon you to provide us that that feedback um, if, for those of you that uh, are so inclined Andy will be will be back live again tonight at 7 p.m. you're certainly welcome to come back and it'll be essentially the same presentation but you know the noon hour and the evening hour uh, always have different questions so you can you can gain as as much the second time around as as the first time around um, with that I'll I'll close this out and I will within a minute or two going to be um, deleting you all 
from the attendee list, there's a session that's going to be a webinar session through Cornell Cooperative Extension on uh, uh, fruit and berry production that they need um, access to a large number of seats. So we're, we're trying to coordinate the use of this technology. But my thanks again to Andy. I'll just um, throw in a, a word for Shorna too. Shorna has uh, part two in December and, uh, and there's a good follow-up. I think Shorna will be talking about some really interesting things that she discovered about aesthetics too. So I just wanted to throw that in. Yes, thank you. Yes, Shorna Broussard Allred here in the Department of Natural Resources um, will be joined by a colleague from Purdue University talking about uh, some of the human perceptions and attitudes related to harvesting. So anyway, thank you all. Enjoy your sun sh sunshiny day if that's what you have. And we'll see you either tonight or in mid-December. Have a great day. Thank you, Andy. Good job.